So, we have covered up till now the entire gamut of testing and uh, validation and uh, we also covered the fact that testing and validation is as important as any other phase. It is not something which is stuck away at the end of the development journey of a product. It is in fact uh, far more important to clear a product as being appropriate or inappropriate for commercial launch based on a very rigorous objective, unbiased and holistic uh, product testing and development approach. Once this is done, we come to commercialization. Commercialization requires major investments because when we talk about prototypes, we talk about uh, a few items, maybe 10 prototypes, 100 prototypes. Even assuming that the cost of developing a prototype is 20x that of uh, a normal uh, standard uh, product, still the cost is manageable. It can be forecast, it can be budgeted and it can be managed without big working capital uh, uh, considerations. But when we talk about commercialization, you need to plan for inventory, you need to think of a dealer channel you need to think of a distribution channel, you need to fill the products all through the pipeline, which means that you have to be a running industrial operation for you to be commercially ready, let alone commercially be successful. But commercialization is the phase where you require major investments and therefore, you require uh, major uh, private equity funding. This is the phase where uh, private equity investors will be willing to look at commercialization and support them. And this is also the phase where you demonstrate your strength and conviction at the scalability of the product. And uh, initially, there are a number of ways you can do the commercialization, but uh, the classic uh, metrics of uh, sales, footfalls, clicks, the number of uh, downloads, various other parameters are there. But the financial parameters are also extremely important. But generally, in today's uh, situation, startups have got certain commercialization principles which are quite different from an established company. In respect of an established company, it is very important for the product to be profitable as soon as possible. The fully accounted cost needs to be uh, met with by a uh, realizable uh, price and then there should be an adequate profit margin, the investments must be recovered and as soon as possible the product must be self-sufficient and it should be profitable on its own. In fact, many established companies struggle with the loading of the costs when you launch a product. So, different accounting principles are uh, deployed to make sure that the initial product does not suffer the uh, difficulties or the burden of the previous development. But even with that kind of approach, it is expected that as soon as possible, hopefully within a year, the product is able to recover its earlier uh, extra costs and is in a position to balance its costs and prices evenly. But in the in respect of startup, the principles are quite different uh, as demonstrated by the practice. The startup typically has got a new technology which is difficult to prove, but if it is proven, it is likely to take over the market all by itself. We will consider in the next session how innovation can be disruptive and how it could uh, take over the market provided it uh, becomes successful. Therefore, there is a huge amount of effort involved in making sure that the product uh, excites the market. And how does the product excite the market? It excites the market when it is available freely and the customers are able to access the product, which means that regardless of the conventional pricing wisdom, regardless of the conventional profit wisdom, the product should be available in the at the hands of the customers for them to appreciate the product. Therefore, the investors as well as the startups look at scaling up as a great priority when we look at uh, startup uh, launches. We also look at uh, scaling up as a great priority because this is innovation based business. If you are not agile and innovative at the same time, 
it is likely that somebody would be equally innovative and more agile and then take your business. Therefore, rapid launch and rapid ramp up are also considered extremely important. Therefore, whether one likes it or not by prudent and regular principles of management, startups tend to buy within quotes uh, the market share, the market presence and uh, rapid uh, growth by deploying a high level of funding to scale up. And all this is driven by the fact that improving the commercialization profile brings more than proportional valuation to the company. So, the excitement of many startups lies not, not only in terms of the profitability of the company, but more importantly by the sky high valuations they command even before the business viability is established. And there are obviously many options for commercialization. So, I demonstrate here a typical uh, commercial uh, rebooting approach because I call it rebooting because uh, commercialization need not always be first time right kind of approach. Typically, we have a product plan, we have a commercialization plan. The first question we face is the, are the test results in line with our expectations? Two answers no and yes. If it is no, identify the plan parameters which we need to modify, go back to the modifiers and come back to the revised product plan and revised commercial plan. On the other hand, we say that the test results are in line with the expectations, then we move to the next stage. Are we sufficiently resourced? Typically, if you have done a proof of concept prototype at a cost of 100, it is expected that to launch it commercially, you will require 10 times that to be able to do a launch, first launch, first year launch. Therefore, can I manage the resources? And if so, there is an answer. If you think that you can't manage the resources, there is again need to go back to the product plan and commercial plan. Once you manage the resources, you got get the sales and whether they are in line with the metrics and then identify the plan parameters that need to be modified. So, it is a kind of iterative process. Why we do this carefully and regularly? Because the very many times the sales determines the valuation the company has. The higher the sales, the higher the valuation irrespective of the profitability that happens through the sales. Therefore, anything which does improvement of sales is welcome for a startup. Now, look at the commercialization approaches which are possible. It is not always through sales that a startup gains in terms of its commercialization. As we said that there are three types of uh, technological endeavors which are possible in a startup. First is innovation, completely innovative product, first time ever. Second is differentiation and third is followership. Followership does not mean that it is not innovative, it is creative in its own way. Probably it provides you much better cost efficiency, much better quality level even if the product is similar. So, the technology pyramid determines what kind of business strategy you have. Once you determine the business strategy you have, there are two components. One is the product strategy, second is the commercial strategy. The product strategy says that do I have the product which goes directly to the business or do I have a product which goes directly to the consumer. So, when we talk about uh, uh, electronic bookstores or electronic uh, retailing, it is the business to consumer, directly it goes to the consumer. When you look at uh, taxi aggregator service, it goes to the consumer. But if you look at uh, let us say a kind of uh, product which helps uh, telecommunication companies manage their uh, billing and receivables activities, it is a business to business uh, portal, business to business app. Therefore, this is a different kind of product strategy you have. But regardless of the product strategy you have, the commercial strategy can be of three types. One is complete ownership of what you are doing. That is, you sell the product by yourself and then get all the revenues and profits yourself. Second, partial monetization. That is, you co-license it to somebody else, get some money inside the company and give some money to the outside party. The third one is complete monetization. That is, you sell off the company or the technology completely. The last one, this which is complete monetization works in biotech area, that is biopharmaceutical area, where you develop a product, 
take the product through the drug discovery phase, take the product through proof of concept in animal models, probably take, uh, take the product through the um, human clinical trials phase 1 and phase 2. And before you take it up for phase 3, where the money required for phase 3 clinical trial involving thousands of uh, volunteers across the world is very staggering, you may decide to license it out. So, that is completely monetizing an asset. Many companies are acquired in big pharma space through this uh, methodology. And when complete monetization takes place, obviously you get huge valuations and the promoters have got the necessary corpus to work on another product or another uh, uh, area as you go forward. So, different commercialization approaches are possible in this kind of uh, uh, startup scenario. The options for example, or as I said is organic sales, that is you sell like an industrial operation. You manufacture the product having developed it and proven it, you, put, you select your own uh, distribution channels, you do the supply chain planning like a mature industrial organization, you do the uh, funding for the inventory and you sell. Second, you feel that you cannot do that, you can franchise it to somebody else to sell. You provide the product, but then you do not uh, do the dealership uh, activity. The third one is licensing. You do not even do the manufacture. You say that yes, I have got the technology, I will license the technology, let somebody else do the product. Or you will give the technology to somebody else for a fee and let that company manufacture the product for you. You can have a joint venture. If you have developed a new uh, wind turbine, you can uh, collaborate with the G to do it jointly, that is a joint venture. Then you can have a distribution alliance where you decide that you will concentrate only on the development and manufacturing aspects, that is where the technology lies and you will not do anything with the marketing area. The other one is to coil, have a coalition, that is we discussed earlier that the entire uh, um, product uh, space is actually an ecosystem. If you want to develop something, you need uh, a battery manufacturer for an electric vehicle, that is you need uh, battery swapping station, you need uh, a ride handling uh, system. So, all of these people may collaborate and say that yes, we all participate and create a joint venture by which we manage this new product and the new technology. So, a coalition can be formed or you can say that uh, I have been holding this company in terms of shareholding by 95 percent, I require huge funding. Therefore, financially I will invite a new people and going. You may decide that I will not go through physical sales, I will do everything online so that I will get uh, uh, minimum effort and maximum uh, returns and a combination of various options. So, a startup once the product is uh, fully proven, validated, has a number of options to pursue depending upon the nature of the product, depending upon the appetite for risk. We have considered earlier that there are two types of products, B2, B2B products and B2C products. B2C products are business to consumer companies which conduct business directly with the customers. Although even when you are dealing with the customers, you may have in business intermediaries that is really not considered a business to business situation. Let us look at a FMCG company that is fast moving consumer goods company like uh, Hindustan Lever or Nestle or Britannia. Obviously, when they supply their products, they supply to the wholesale agents they, who in turn supply to the uh, uh, retailers and who in, in turn display the products and then sub sell to the consumers. Although the point of sale is the retail, but it comes through several layers. It does not mean that uh, you, Hindustan Unilever is in a business to business situation. Actually, they are with the consumer, they are, happen to be the layers. That is a business to consumer because the product is sold to the consumer through a particular channel, but consumer determines how a consumer means a whole uh, big population determines how this product is uh, perceived and how the company can uh, go through the development. On the other hand, B2B means it is sold to a few people and they have got an ability to use the app for their own requirements. For example, uh, you may have an app to control uh, attendance in uh, colleges and schools. 
there may be thousands of colleges and schools which you would like to target, but you will sell it only to the those schools and colleges and they have their uh, system to manage. Similarly, HR outsourcing, it may, be, it may be an app which is sold to the companies, not to the individuals. Similarly, the billing cycle app that could be sold to the telecommunication and other companies. So, these are business to business uh, com companies. Typically, in, in today's digital world, there are far more uh, business to consumer uh, companies than business to business companies. And the general perception is that business to consumer companies have got better valuation because they have better market which they are trying to address. But there is also evidence that when you have uh, proper execution, business to business uh, companies also have got uh, good uh, valuations and good revenues. Here we have got uh, select top ranking uh, companies in B2C area. Many of the companies are well known to you, Flipkart, Mantra, Jabong, Snapdeal. These are in electronic commerce fashion. You got Paytm which is a digital payments company, you got Ola which is a ride handling company, Big Basket, grocery supplier, Book My Show which makes uh, uh, concert tickets and other tickets available to you, Shop Clues, Zomato, food delivery, Baiju's online education, Lenskart which provides uh, spectacles on demand, free charge for uh, mobile uh, prepaid applications. And most of them have been founded in between 2005 and 2010 and they have received huge amounts of uh, funding to date and their revenues are just equal to or less than the funding they have received. You can therefore, you can say that the revenues have almost annual revenues I mean these are not cumulative revenues. But if you see for an established company the revenue to investment ratio will be quite different compared to this. The, in the sales turnover compared to an investment level will be many times over. Whereas, here you can see that the funding is in some cases higher than the revenue. And you look at the profit after tax, many companies are uh, actually make losses. In fact, there is probably no digital internet business to consumer company which is having reg regular full time profitability. In fact, when uh, Anant was the CEO of Mantra, he said that his goal was to be the first. Uh, full time profit making e commerce company that was his goal. So, which shows that how difficult it is and how challenging it is to make profits in the internet uh, era. Yet, as I said, they attract huge amounts of uh, valuations, they attract um, huge amounts of uh, investments. Then we have uh, business to business uh, companies in Mobi, delivery. Ecom Express which is in logistics field, Power to SME, Exotel. Now, you will see that Inmobi which is also rated as one of the top 50 disruptively innovative companies in globally has become profitable and the loss levels in these companies are a bit less compared to the levels in the business to internet companies. So, there is a difference. So, you can be successful, you can be prudentially profitable in business to business uh, startups, whereas you can be very successful in terms of the footfalls, in terms of the scale up in business to consumer companies. So, the tables bring out that digital startups do not follow the conventional business principles of established brick and mortar uh, businesses. In fact, uh, there has been a report recently about various uh, uh, internet companies, various digital companies. Three years ago, they have made certain uh, revenues and certain losses. Over the last three years, those companies have experienced tripling of losses. That is, the losses have tripled along with the revenues. But the valuations of the company have also tripled. Normally, in an in an established business, if the losses triple, the valuations uh, go down more than proportionately. Here, you have an inverse proportionality which is working. That is, the higher the losses because of the higher the revenue situation, the higher is the valuation. 
this comes back to the hypothesis which I discussed earlier that the perception of investors is that the startup is doing something fuzzy, doing something for the first time, doing something which the market will eventually buy. So, even if you are part of a large market, you are spending resources to capture a market share, even if your investment is going into funding losses what you are achieving is market dominance for a new technology. And once the scale of operation becomes viable, where the technology becomes uh, more uh, competitive, you are likely to dominate the market in such a way that you will have uh, more than proportionate uh, profits. So, the calculation of valuations for digital startups is based on this. There, there is generally no linkage with either revenues or profitability. It is although huge discounts are offered and market share is gained, market presence is gained, uh, people in the business feel that this is a cost well worth spending to capture the market share and support the technology. Many times this hypothesis works because if you are the first to do the electronic uh, commerce and you are there like Flipkart is. It is very difficult for somebody else to emulate the system or mimic the system and become the second uh, company. But at the same time, it is also possible that uh, as with an established principle, the more efficient you are, the more effective you could be. Even before uh, uh, Flipkart came, probably Snapdeal was there as an effective electronic commerce company. But Flipkart was much more innovative, much more agile and applied more uh, commercially prudent principles to be able to achieve its uh, overall national market presence. And therefore, the, it was more successful, although it also continues to make losses. But at least as a expanding organization, it provided for itself a greater stability and uh, security. Similarly, if you assume that you are the first, therefore, you can fund yourself to losses as much as possible because nobody else would enter could also go wrong. Uh, there is a digital payments company which has been a pioneer in India and uh, it has enjoyed the inverse proportionality rule. That is although the company has done a huge discounting, decided to take on head on the opportunity provided by demonetization, go into all the rural areas, spread itself into nook and corner and become the preferred uh, payments channel and therefore, uh, took in lots of investments. Uh, but today we have uh, another 6 companies which are having their own presence in the payments, digital payments area and they are uh, proving to be good or uh, tough competitors. Some of them are uh, even government uh, sponsored applications. Therefore, it is not always true that the assumption that a startup's technology is going to be a pioneering technology, it is going to be the dominating uh, technology. Therefore, it must be uh, supported with funding at any cost, need not necessarily hold out to be true at all times. Therefore, if you balance out all the considerations, yes, when the technology is novel, when the technology is not really appreciated by the market it makes sense to fund the losses and capture market share. But at the same time, the prudential principles of management of a company, which is making sure that the costs are properly absorbed, properly accounted for and properly remunerated through fair pricing, principle to ensure that the investments are turned over, the working capital is turned over in a proper manner, those also cannot be ignored. So, when a startup combines both these parameters that is the cost of acquiring company within limits and cost of ramping up the business within limits and also be aggressive and uh, risk oriented in capturing the market, then probably you will get a very balanced way of developing the market. These are not easy decisions that could be made. And many times when funding follows the startup saying that yes, you have the technology, I am going to fund you, it is very difficult to resist the temptation of buying share at any cost, buying uh, presence at any cost. But underlying that is the need for being effective and efficient. So, ultimately summing up all these things, 
the desirability, feasibility and viability, they determine how good you are at commercialization. As the CEO of a startup, your goal is to ensure that the product you have made is desirable for the customer, both in terms of the MVP, the core and the UDP, the ultimate. Then the product should be relevant for the marketplace despite the time loss lapse which is uh, there during the development phase and it should be attractive to buy, own and use, that is the desirability. Feasibility to design and develop, it should be repetitive in manufacture, it should be efficient, you should be able to establish a good supply chain, a dis good distribution channel and the technology should be sustainable against competition and you should be able to make prudent decisions between organic versus inorganic development of the product and it should be viable for both the consumer as well as for the user in terms of the break even ROA and also the life cycle cost value for the consumer. If this desirability, feasibility, viability triad is protected, the commercialization is bound to happen on uh, prudential lines as you go forward. So there are basic questions to be addressed in this desirability, viability, feasibility. The questions to be addressed are, do the users really want this product which I have made? Will it fit into people's lives? Will it appeal to them? Will they actually want it? Will they finally buy it? So these are the desirability aspects. The questions on feasibility, can I make the product at the cost which the consumer wants? Is the technology within the company or can be accessed easily? Is the technology foolproof and also cost effective? As regards to viability, you should look at the life cycle cost of the product. What is the value the customer would see at different price points? Yes, I can do deep discounting, I can do mid discounting, I cannot do discounting at all. But what is the value the customer would see for the product at different points? Therefore, what would be the underlying demand and profitability at the different price points? Which means it's a kind of sensitivity analysis on the viability of the product, which again depends on the desirability and feasibility that come. If your uh, break even is lower because of the answers to the questions, then you are in a position to price the product better. On the other hand, if the product is burdened with high break even because of the answers to the previous question, then you will be able to, you will not be able to price the product appropriately. Therefore, it is a kind of a moving puzzle as with all management issues, the desirability, the feasibility and the viability. Some companies take the risk to take the bull by the horns as they say, first scale up, reduce the cost and therefore uh, make it more attractive to the customer. Some other companies decide to get the customer acceptance first and then slowly ramp up the product. But it depends upon the nature of the product, the pioneering nature or the monopoly nature of the technology and also the execution capabilities of the firm backed by the funding capability key is to understand the sensitivity for each of these things. Now within commercialization, we have got uh, many stages. There are uh, seven stages which I have uh, put here. First the product which is fully tested and validated ultimate desirable product. Second stage of commercialization is establishing the supply chain. It should be agile, flexible like a full grown uh, established company. Physical manufacture, what do I control in house, what do I outsource. For example, uh, for a uh, medicine, doing the final formulation within your own uh, company is extremely important. You may choose to outsource the research and development, you may out choose to outsource the act active pharma uh, pharmaceutical ingredient, but you should certainly do the final formulation within yourself so that you are able to control the parameters of uh, the medicine. The quality check, how do I do the quality check? in process at the material stage and also at the finished product stage. Then where, how do I have the dis network to reach to the customer and actual sales and collection receivables, the billing cycle, the order to delivery, the how does the money flow happen and customer assurance and product performance feedback, how do I ensure that the customer uh, really understands. These seven principles are no different between the startup and the industrial uh, company. Those startups which appreciate this industrial cycle will be in a position to launch their products onto a commercial scale easily. But those startups who do not have 
with the ability to understand the challenges of industrial cycle are likely to face issues. Uh, we will cover in one subsequent session the transition when you make when you make and how you make of uh, startup to a mature corporation and how important it is for ensuring that the startup uh, becomes successful. So, in the commercial considerations is always uh, tempting to take a short term view and it is necessary to take a long term view. So, you look at a business model, the short term view market share is the primary driver, but if you take a long term view revenue with profitability that would be the primary driver. In the short term view I exist to monetize the asset and the technology therefore, valuation becomes the primary driver. Whereas, in the long term view business viability because I want to grow this startup into a leading company in the industrial world therefore, business sustainability is the primary motivation. In the short term view funding of the losses to gain share through equity investments that is the motivator. Whereas, in long term view funding of losses, but with a partial asset mod monetization. If you are developing uh, 4 new drug candidates in 4 different therapeutic areas, you may decide to license out one, so that the other 3 can be funded properly. In the short term view there is a very low emphasis on cash generation and conservation, cash is spent somewhat uh, speedily to gain market share. Whereas, in long term view there is always prudent in uh, cash management, you always keep the cash to ensure that you are in a position to uh, handle unknown uh, eventualities. In the leadership style, in the short term view there is a clear distinction of the role investors have and the operating team has. Investors are seen only for the investment sake, whereas in the long term view uh, the view is that the investors also have got uh, an aligned uh, objective along with the startups in ensuring that the company is uh, grown. So, therefore, there is so much more importance to governance and mentoring in, in the long term view. In leadership style of short term uh, startup it is uh, more on execution, execution and execution, whereas here it is execution with uh, governance there will be more platforms for joint engagement with investors and the other key advisors. Lot of reliance on co-founders and the employees in the startup phase, whereas in the long term view you take uh, professionals into consideration, you try to professionalize the organization as soon as possible. Then in the startup short term view there is lot of difficulty in scaling up the organization, whereas here because of timely professionalization you are able to scale up the organization very effectively. The technology in the short term startup early prototyping lot of emphasis on core technology tendency to offer many things to the customer, so that the customer uh, takes it at any cost, whereas uh, in the long term view you prove the core and then you follow in a staged manner to make sure that you introduce the technology in a graded follow on manner, so that the full impact of the technology is felt more sustainably over a longer time horizon. As far as the behavior is concerned, the short term is completely ignorant or uh, non cognizant of the family circumstances or friendly circumstances, because the passion fires them so much regardless of whatever are the impediments they would like to go forward, they at times uh, ignore the environmental risks also. Whereas, uh, from a long term perspective people would like to have a holistic uh, work life balance, make sure that there is an actualization not only from the valuation and revenue and profitability, there is also actualization that occurs because of the contribution that is made to the society and the economy by the startup. Therefore, uh, if you summarize and look at it from these 4 factors which is business model adopted, the leadership style adopted, the technology model uh, that is embedded and the behavioral approach taken, there is clearly a difference between a startup which would uh, do a short term management of its affairs versus a startup which would do a long term management of its affairs. Obviously, there are advantages of aggressive commercialization which we have uh, discussed in the past, but there are also risks. We need to make sure that 
uh, the logical goal of revenue generation and wealth creation is uh, met in full, which means that we have to control the losses that occur in any startup operation through prudent. There must be ratios set up for, for investment to revenue, there must be ratios set up for governing uh, asset turnovers, there must be ratios set up to ensure development expense to the total expense to make sure that we lay the foundation for the startup to grow in an orderly fashion. Although the funding may be available, we should be able to take the funding but deploy it in an appropriate manner so that we do not buy share, we do not buy uh, market presence, we earn it through our product performance. Then the cost of acquisition of the customer, how high it could be, we, we should have certain prudential uh, levels. Particularly because India is an emerging economy and it does not have a huge surplus of money floating around. It is important that as we embark on this startup mission, we make use of uh, money in a prudent and efficient way rather than a splurge because startups by definition have high mortality rate if not done properly. So, if you splurge lot of cash, lot of money on startup development and many of such startups uh, wither away into the uh, annals of history, then it is money which is lost. On the other hand, even if we do fewer startups, but if we do those startups effectively and efficiently with proper deployment of capital, probably the overall economy would uh, gain uh, in a much more uh, substantive way. So, to summarize in a way, the growth of Indian industry and economy is entirely due to entrepreneurship. Every company which we see today, big, medium or small, has been an entrepreneurial company at some time or the other in some form or the other. Therefore, there is no doubt that entrepreneurship at the core of industrial development. But at the same time, we cannot blindly go by the western model by which several startups and millions of dollars of investment are poured into startup sector, but only a few will survive. If you are able to develop a hybrid model in which the creativity and the innovation of the startup movement is combined with the prudence and the uh, conservatism of an established mature mainstream industry, then we will get an entrepreneurial movement which is very uh, specific to Indian needs and which could be very helpful for uh, maximizing wealth generation in the uh, country. Definitely the technological change is non-linear, it is disruptive and it is unpredictable. Therefore, entrepreneurial systems tend to be volatile, tend to be unpredictable, but at the same time they have to also work collaboratively with each other uh, and with the mainstream companies and vice versa to make sure that we develop this uh, entrepreneurial movement to our national competitive advantage. The commercialization happens in such a way that the investments are uh, frugally and prudently used. So, to make sure that we do, we stay on this line, we have to continue this questioning attitude. The questioning approach has got uh, seven factors. One, has the customer achieved the kind of uh, savings or benefits in terms of time, money and effort as envisaged? If yes, obviously, this is a product for scale up and we can go gung ho on scaling up of the product. Is there any residual gap in terms of value utilization, value maximization? If so, there is obviously potential for improving the product or introducing other products. What are the most liked features of my product? What are the least liked features of my value proposition? And what are the other options the consumer has? Does he have to buy this type of product at all? Should he go for some other product like for example, in the uh, printers, should you go for uh, dot matrix printers versus inkjet printers with laser jet printers, color options, non color options, number of uh, options are there. So, what is it likely to be the best course for the customer? Is the value proposition challenged by the time lapse, by the shift in consumer preferences? If so, are there enough grounds to consolidate this product or develop a new product? Is there therefore, a trigger for the next disruption that I as a startup could do. So, this whole uh, genre of thinking of uh, identifying a problem and solving a problem, it is a never ending quest. Even after you introduce the product, even after you see the product taking off in the market, 
even after you see the customers enjoying the product, there is always this potential to understand the gaps, to understand the value proposition and to keep enhancing the product width you have and ensure that disruptions take place uh, continuously. So, at the core of this as a startup our job is to attract the core customers with a new def well defined, well executed product platform. The second is that yes, I have got this customer segment, I have made the product and make sure that that customer segment is owned and uh, retained by us. And the third is that I have got a technology, I have got a capability, I have got a core uh, product. Therefore, I have established a very good product market nexus which has given me the viability, given me the assurance. How do I expand? How do I use my technology to develop other products and keep expanding? Whether you see uh, huge companies like Microsoft, Apple or Google or you see smaller companies like Fracto who are st medical startup. You will see that once the core is stabilized, once the core is uh, captured, people have got the capability and ability and also the opportunity to get into strategic adjuncts and keep expanding their product market profiles. So, it is a question of uh, continuous growth to understand in the consumer needs, develop the products which meet their requirements and most importantly going through this phase of uh, ideation, prototype development, testing, validation and commercialization in a seamless and uh, iterative manner, keeping in mind prudential principles of uh, fundraising, prudential pr principles of fund deployment and aggressive at prudential ways of commercialization. When all these things combine together in a seamless fashion in a very effective manner, then we will get a startup model which is very relevant for uh, Indian requirements.